welcome to uh, the Institute for Government and thank you very much for joining us today. We are delighted uh, to welcome for this event Sir Chris Wormold, Permanent Secretary at the Department of Health and Social Care and Head of the Civil Service Policy Profession. Uh, and we're very grateful to Oracle for sponsoring this series of events. Just briefly, housekeeping, if any fire alarms go off, uh, do feel, follow any members of staff or the signs which are there. Um, on your way out. Now, the Institute for Government have a uh, long-standing <coughs> interest in the policy profession and in the wider functional agenda and in the quality of policy making, of course, in Whitehall. We've written extensively about how to improve policy making. Uh, in September 2017, we also published Professionalising Whitehall, which was our stock take of the civil service's ongoing efforts <coughs> to professionalise some of these key activities. Uh, not just obviously uh, policy making, but also project delivery, financial management. Uh, we called for a greater representation of specialists in top leadership positions, uh, not only for the sake of diversity, but also so that those with operational knowledge can bring their insights to the top table. Uh, and this is the final in our series on professionalising the civil service that Oracle have kindly sponsored. Uh, and we're very pleased to be finishing it with uh, Sir Chris, uh, who will speak in a few moments. But first, we will hear from Nick Jackson, who is Director, Finance and Performance Innovation at Oracle. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. And uh, it's with delight and pleasure that uh, I welcome to this the last in the series, as uh, Catherine said, of the um, last two and a half years, I think, we've been working with IFG around the subject of professionalising Whitehall particularly, I guess, focused on previously around finance and HR and procurement and latterly picking up um, the operational delivery profession with John Thompson. And today, great to be working on the policy side. Um, I guess some people might ask who Oracle are, what is it we do, why is this relevant to us? And some people may know us from the finance and HR side, but actually, for me, having been in policy, key to policy is, is about the quality of data. Um, and data is very much around what we as an organisation are, are around. Our very first project ever uh, as an organisation was with the CIA looking at data management uh, back in the late 70s. So it's kind of what we are, we are fundamentally about. For me personally, this is of interest. I, I started off many years ago as a civil service fast streamer. Um, that's how I started life and so I'm really interested in how it's progressed. Back in my day, we were called generalists. I don't think that's a term we're allowed to use nowadays. No. Um, and uh, the nearest thing to professionalism was what I then became, which was a finance professional. Because the Treasury in those days wanted policy to understand the costs of what it was, uh, the options that it was coming up with, and to be able to present them in ways that uh, uh, made the financial implications much more transparent. So I'm, I'm the product of, of those days of early professionalism. So really interesting to see how things are progressing now. But policy, I think, is really at an opportunity, opportune moment to be quite significantly impacted by um, the digital agenda. Um, never before have you had the ability to bring together so many different data sets from so many different parties to interface with um, society as a whole and to, and to get a, a wide variety of input and to work in a much more collaborative ways um, at speed and to analyze that data, to do scenario modeling, understand what if, understand implications of, of different policy options in a way you couldn't before. So I'm really interested to hear what Chris has to say. I have not heard Chris speak before, so I, um, I asked my other half, who has heard Chris speak before, uh, who works for <laughs> CIUK, she used to work for the NHS, and, and to uh, testament to his impact, she shared that she remembered two things from what he said a year ago. The two things were, firstly, there is no such thing as a generalist, but actually what, what, what she took away was the importance of prof policy professionals having depth in their subject matter, yeah, being subject matter expertise and bringing policy as a process around that. And the second thing she shared with me um, was you can only kind of do policy on the basis of the best evidence you've got available. The job of policy is to bring that to life understand how you're presenting that to the decision makers. So decision makers have a clear set of options against which they are then making decisions. And um, it's that transparency agenda, I guess. So with that, I'll hand over to Chris, and I expect to take a few more messages away. Thank you. Oh. Oh. Thank you very much. Uh, fortunately, I still agree with both of those things. 
So, uh, and we'll say something about it. I'm, I'm going to sort of pace around because uh, that's what I uh, do. Uh, lovely to see you all uh, here uh, today. It's a disturbingly high-powered looking audience, uh, including more people than I would like who I've actually worked with. So if those people could refrain from um, rolling their eyes, sighing, saying the words, if only, uh, about various things I claim to have done, that would be very much appreciated. You can uh, tell me uh, uh, afterwards. Right, uh, policy making. I think the idea is um, I talk for a bit, then you ask me some questions, then you ask me uh, some questions, and, uh, and we see where it's uh, uh, all goes. I say, my day job is uh, uh, being permanent secretary at the uh, health department, previously run the education uh, department, where I spent most of my uh, career. Those are the two things I think I actually know something about, so quite a lot of my examples will be drawn from those, but hopefully relevant to, uh, 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 to uh, lots of people. Right, first, what do we actually mean when we say policy? It's one of those words we use. Uh, but very rarely defined. Uh, this is how we uh, explain it to new fast streamers, basically, is the inter as the intersection of these three things. Um, it is about the bringing together of the evidence, the analysis, the subject knowledge. Um, it is the adding the democracy and policy bit and understanding how that interplays, and then asking yourself the question, and will it actually work? Um, and the policymaker lives in that intersection there. And their job is to be able to bring together those sorts of things into something in which you can make a decision. Now, to state the obvious, um, the policymaker, your classic civil service policymaker, is not the expert at any of those things. Um, there are other people who are more expert. There are statisticians, there are economists, there are people who understand delivery, there are commercial people, etc., um, politicians, all that who understand each of those things, what the policymaker brings to the party is exactly as you've just described. It's that ability, can we bring that together, weigh up those competing types of information, and say public value lives there, you know, in this set of uh, uh, things. So that's how, we, um, that, that, that's how we describe it. And I think it's a pretty good definition. And actually coming back to the, where do we add value, it's in that center bit, um, is really important uh, to uh, uh, all this. So who are we? We reckon it's about 20,000 civil servants, uh, at, uh, uh, which actually out of a civil service of 400,000, it's not that many actually. You know, the vast majority of the civil service works in John Thompson's bit of actually delivering public uh, services. Um, uh, we, we, we think we're about 20,000. Uh, now, of course, we're not, we are categorically not actually a profession. We're not a profession in the sense that in my day job, any of the professions would recognise there is no entry barrier. You know, there's no licence to make policy. Um, very important, there never is one. You know, we do not want an elite cadre of policy makers. You want lots and lots of people contributing to policies. We don't want to be like law or medicine and accountancy. You can only do it if you've got a qualification. But we do want professional standards. As it were. So, in terms of what are the disciplines, do we train policymakers properly? Um, do we have policy making techniques? Do we know if our policy making is any good? We want to be as good as that as any other profession, but without the professional barrier bit. And what we focus on, press the button too soon, is the question of how do we advise well on policy? How do we train and develop policymakers? Not policy decisions and the substance of policy. This again is very important. It is not our job to say a particular policy is good and bad. Right? That is rightly for ministers, for public debate, for manifestos. No, so what is the substance of policy um, is a matter for public de debate and democracy and parliament and all that. The question for us as policy makers is how do we provide good advice? Yes, and how do we tell if we're providing uh, 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 good advice? Uh, that's extremely important. I mean, obviously, the uh, substance of policy gets debated a lot in the media, in Parliament, at committee hearings, and etc. The questions of how do we do it debated much less. So that's what we think we bring to the party as a, uh, a professional thing, and we're not bad at it. Uh, so this was, uh, this is the insights, uh, you know, I think this one was published this morning, wasn't it? IFG's involved, isn't it? But it's IFG, uh, Blavatnik. These are the, um, uh, the best rankings we have on um, uh, 
uh, policy making. They're not, they're not brilliant yet. This is only the second time they've ever done them. You know, the evidence base of this, you know, it's probably a little shaky. But in terms of what we have, we actually think we're pretty good. Clearly, Finland and Denmark are beating us at the moment. So we'll have to do a bit more to find out what they're doing. But anyway, uh, it's, um, and it breaks down rather more. Actually, the UK apparently came top overall as a civil service. But anyway, but just in the policy making bit, it works a bit like uh, this. So we're very strong in some areas and other areas, uh, particularly how we work with agencies there. Sorry if you can't read this. But anyway, we're weak. It gives us some sort of basis to say, we've always thought we're quite good at policy making. Actually, the best studies there are suggest there are, but lots of room uh, for uh, improvement. So what have we actually been doing? Um, in 2013, actually in this room, uh, we launched a uh, program of improving uh, policy making, uh, where we had 12 actions that the whole of Whitehall, every permanent secretary signed up to, shouldn't say Whitehall, whole of government, um, every permanent secretary signed up to as to what we would be doing to uh, improve policy making. I'm not going to turn talk through this in intense uh, detail because obviously there's quite a lot of it. So I'm going to talk about ones which um, uh, where we didn't when we assess this, which we did with the assistance of uh, uh, some civil servants from Canada and New Zealand because we wanted a bit of peer review. Which ones did we think we got more progress to make? Uh, on. So on this slide, uh, to, uh, we haven't quite got right how we communicate as a profession yet. We have some very, very committed people to the profession, but actually we have still have quite a lot of people who do policy who don't really recognise that they're in a profession and wouldn't know what we are doing. So we've got a cadre of people who are very, very keen on this agenda and some we've still uh, got to uh, reach. Um, this one, uh, actually probably our most difficult one of all, is how do you actually tell if the piece of policy advice you have produced was actually good? We've got lots of ways of telling whether the decision was good and whether the substance worked, but of course there's a lot more in that than, uh, than whether the actual policy advice was good. There are things we can look at. You know, was it actually evidence-based? We do a thing in the Department of Health where we do a survey of which submissions, you know, actual policy submissions, reach our evidential standards to the um, uh, acceptable level that our chief economist and our chief scientist set. You can do those sorts of things. But it's actually quite difficult to say the policy advice we put to ministers this year is 8% better than that last year. It's a really difficult thing to measure, and we haven't uh, cracked it yet. We've done a lot of interesting things, but we have not cracked it. Um, on this page, again, there's a lot we think that we have done, some of which I'll come uh, uh, back to. Um, this one, I think, is a very interesting one. It goes with the previous one. Does every person in the policy profession think it is their job to be up to date on latest thinking on how you make policy? in the same way that every doctor in the country thinks it is their job to be up to date with what is in the BMJ or the Lancet or at the limits of medical practice. No, not yet. Some do, some don't. Work in progress, but I don't think we've quite got the culture yet. Well, and indeed, this is what our peer reviewing said. The same as those professions that we would measure ourselves uh, uh, against on uh, uh, that one. And uh, these are the last four. The, uh, tw uh, uh, the 12, the top one we haven't, uh, haven't quite cracked yet. We're extremely pleased with some of the things we have achieved in training and development. We think we've made a huge amount of progress on induction, so a bit more about that later. Huge amount of progress on the, the senior civil service. We've got a challenge which we have not cracked about what happens to people mid-career. Actually, I think, John Thompson is nodding, so I think we have this challenge in quite a lot of civil service professions, actually. We've also got a brilliant fast stream, um, you know, regularly rated you know, one of the top graduate employers. We're doing much better on things like apprenticeships and general induction, etc. We do quite well there. And then we've got really quite a good offer for the senior civil service. Gap in between, we've got much less. And that is also, I don't know when you left us, but also that's when we lose most people. 
actually, between being the sort of the graduate trainee and becoming a senior civil servant. So I actually think that's a cross civil service issue for us, but we definitely have it in the policy profession and one we're working on, uh, uh, working on right now. So we had our 12 actions in 2013, we've reviewed them. We do actually think we did most of what we said we would do, but some things with uh, uh, work in progress. Uh, so, so that leaves us with the question of um, where, we, uh, uh, where do we go from here? We do actually think 12 actions was too many, by the way. That was one of the things our review said. <laughs> Have to learn from your mistakes. Uh, uh, we've been characterizing what we do in the, uh, uh, in the policy profession under, under these three headings. So we don't normally talk about uh, the 12. We normally talk about these questions of open, uh, professional and consistent as being what it is we're trying to achieve. And I'll say a bit about uh, uh, each of them, uh, what we've been doing and where we think we need to go, uh, go further. Now the open bit, the first one, this was a big thing for Francis Maud. This was when he was doing his reforms of the civil service. This is one of the things he wanted from policy. Can it be more open? And he was right. No. So the, the era of policy making where tremendously clever people went into a dark room together, had a brilliant idea, and then announced it to a grateful nation. Was it like that, Richard? Was it ever like that? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, we're not that clever anymore, quite clearly. And the world uh, has, uh, uh, has changed. Uh, the job of the policy maker, and it goes with that diagram I started with, has to be the person who sits at the centre and reaches out to what is world-leading opinion. So the job of the civil servant is not to be the personal expert normally, but it is to know who, who are the personal experts and what do they think and how do I bring them in. Which jurisdictions are better at whatever the subject is than, uh, is it Germany, is it Denmark, is it Finland? You know, we were talking about technical education. Who is actually good at technical education and do we know what they do? That's the question. What are the top people in universities think? What are the other nations of the UK Think. Now, an awful lot of interesting things happen in Wales, Scotland, etc. We're doing a big push on uh, our changes to organ donation today. Classic bit of policy making. Wales went first. We learned from them, as it were. Uh, to, um, but the bits I particularly want to, wanted to emphasise and the bits where we want to go further are these three things at the bottom. Uh, the, uh, 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 because they are much more about the, the ones at the top are the ones we classically do where we look out to experts, and we do want to do those things, um, and we want to be better at them, but we also want to look out to the rest of the world, um, you know, to people and users and etc. And these three things are some of the things we've been doing in the, those areas. Policy Lab. Policy Lab is here, so I won't say too much because you'll contradict me. Uh, applying ethnographic techniques to policy. Um, you know, have we tracked user experiences in the way that almost any commercial organisation would do? Do we know what happens to somebody when they walk into a benefits office or whatever it is? And have we tracked that and have we used those sort of user-centred approaches to uh, policy making? Behavioural insights, obviously championed by David Halpern, previously a resident uh, here. I won't say much about that because obviously that's got a lot of uh, uh, traction. And then particularly, you raised it, uh, digital policy making. Not just we can use machines to do the things we used to do by hand, which of course we can do, but actually the capacity of digital to have a completely different interaction with the public, I'll come back to this one, actually change the nature of the public debate. Move from you know, those classic consultations where the same people send in largely the same replies um, to something where you can actually have a conversation with um, uh, users. Uh, my department, before I was there, um, did a huge exercise about um, uh, what were the, uh, and it did it online, of what were the actual experiences of carers. You know, people were caring at home and people were contributing you know, as they were doing it. And of course, that is so different from holding a consultation meeting or you know, asking the representative groups. You want to do all those things, but actually digital opens up not just doing things more efficiently, but actually a completely different relationship uh, with the world, as it were. So those three areas are the things, I think, and, and, and related are things where we want to go much further. We want to continue doing all these sort of classic things of other experts. 
but also that how do we make our policy making much more grounded in um, uh, to, uh, uh, what individuals do. So that's the open bit. Uh, the professional bit. <laughs> Someone in the other room really objected to something I've just said. <laughs> and threw something at the screen. Uh, so the professional bit is, uh, this is how do we train people, basically. And as I say, I've said a bit about this uh, already. We're very pleased with what we have done uh, on the indu induction side. We just started our apprenticeship program, very popular. Lots of people want to do it, a new route into policy uh, making with proper training and a qualification uh, that we're uh, doing at the other end. We have our, what we believe, Richard, I think to be, we, actually we've got some people, is the LSE here? I think they might be. We believe to be the only joint venture masters in public policy between a university and a civil service that we run with the LSE, which we send 30 people a year on, uh, has tremendous feedback uh, to which we do at SCS level. And as I say, the bit we want to go further on is this middle bit. Um, where we have a series of things, each of which is quite high quality, but could we say we've got the right offer for your grade seven principal, whatever they're called at the moment, policy maker. No, we haven't quite, so that's the bit we want to go uh, uh, further, uh, further on. So that's the professional bit, and then the consistent uh, bit. Now, when I talk to ministers of, actually, I've worked for senior ministers of all three recent parties of government, this is their biggest complaint. Don't know what, we've got some ex-ministers in the room, don't know what we'll to make special advisors in the room, uh, to, um, but I uh, don't know if you agree, but um, what a lot of our feedback is from ministers is the best advice is brilliant, it's fantastic, it's as good as you get from Goldman's or anyone, wonderful, but it's not all like that. And actually the gap between the really good and the not is quite high. And indeed I've had some ministers say to me, there is no middle ground, that they've never read a moderate piece of policy advice. It's either been, yeah, this is what I want, or I don't want to read it, I want somebody else. Very little in the middle, actually. Now, that is a challenge for us. Now, how are we going to be consistent in our policy making in the same way that if we go to Goldman's, you expect a Goldman standard piece of advice, or if you go to your lawyers, you expect, you know, or if you go to your doctor, you expect something that meets professional standards. This consistency question, um, I think is a really big one for us. Lots of things we're doing, you know, policy tests and standards and policy making techniques, but it is really hard because every piece of policy making is different. Policy making in health is actually different from transport or different from MOD. You can't just standardise the process and say that's fine now, as it were. But that question of how we continually challenge ourselves is every single piece of policy advice in that category of, yeah, it's fantastic. Um, that's, uh, that's what we're trying to uh, uh, achieve there. And we pulled it all together into this, which we're also very pleased with, uh, to, which is, I think, the first time we have ever attempted to create professional standards for policy makers. Uh, to, so we did a big exercise across the policy profession to actually try and identify what are the actual things a policy maker should know about when they make policy. Not be an expert in, clearly, because you couldn't be, but at the level of, I know when to ask an expert, I know what question to ask, I understand the answer, and I know how to build that answer into my policy making. So, you know, I've done my MBA economics, no one's ever gonna ask me to do a piece of economic analysis. My ex-chief economist, though, was shaking his head slightly too vigorously. But I did expect to know what question to ask Tim Loynig, to understand the answer, and to be able to trade that against other things, as it were. So I expected, to, I expected a level of knowledge at that level. Now, we would expect most policymakers to have that level of knowledge in all these categories. Maybe be an expert in one or two, uh, to, um, but have a working knowledge to be able to have a conversation with a statistician, to know how parliament works, to, act, to know your own subject area, know who's the expert in your subject area um, in all these things. And the idea is that it gives people who are starting out on a policy making career, or even halfway through it, a sort of roadmap of which of these things do I reach that standard in? Could I have that conversation with an economist? Yes. Actually though, am I really good at horizon scanning? Most people are not. Okay, that's something I need to develop. 
That's something I need to be better at. So the idea is we give people a roadmap of how would you develop yourself, and actually how do you construct a team? You know, if you're creating a team to make policy, well, you probably want all of these skills somewhere, or most of them. So it were. Um, and we then try and base all our training and development on this picture. Also, can we use it for induction? Can we use it for poor performance? Can we use it for promotion? All those sorts of things. It opens up all sorts of things. But we designed it as a training and development uh, uh, thing, and uh, we're trying it out in lots of departments uh, right now. So we will uh, uh, we'll see how it uh, works. Uh, the other big thing, and this is something the uh, Cabinet Secretary... How am I doing on time? I'm okay for five minutes. Uh, this is something the Cabinet Secretary is uh, uh, very, very keen on, um, is this question of how do we join up better. He has this thing drawn from um, his national security experience about the fusion doctrine, some of you will have heard of. Can you apply the same sorts of principles to some of these types of issue that don't fit easily into a departmental silo? There are some very good things about departmental silos. You, know, you get focus on all that. Um, but there are also some very bad things. You know, if we're going to do sustainability, it's not going to be a single department that delivers it. Well, how do we join up? How do we fuse in the fusion doctrine language? Everything we do around sustainability into a coherent system, as opposed to lots of departments doing different things. So the policy profession will need to step up to um, uh, that you know, completely correct challenge. That if you look at what are the policy problems we have not solved, they are very frequently these big cross-cutting things where it's not obvious whose job it is to solve, as it were. And I think that is one of the big coming policy challenges and something we have to be better uh, at. And as a result, we are doing, you know, now we've basically finished the 12 actions within the policy profession, we are doing a uh, you know, formal review, actually, with different people leading it, of, of where do we want the policy profession to go next, you now under those sorts of categories, and how are we going to pick up you know, we're quite good at individual pieces of policy. We're quite probably better than we should be at crisis management, all those sorts of things. But how are we going to do those like wicked problems that we've never solved, despite people with huge brains having been focused on them for decades? So, um, so that's what we're uh, doing around there. Um, I'm nearly there. Uh, to, we will continue uh, to focus on a lot of the things we've been doing uh, already, most of which I've uh, talked about already. I haven't mentioned this one, which is very important to us. Um, how diverse and inclusive is our policy making? Both the policy makers, but also how we do policy. How do we bring um, unconventional views to the table? How do we avoid groupthink in policy making, particularly if we're training people to do it, uh, to, uh, which is always a problem with training systems. Uh, to, so we, we want to address those diversity and inclusion questions from all those things. Uh, but we also, and this is what I'll finish with, um, we've got quite a series of longer term issues we need to uh, work to, and I think this will be the, um, uh, uh, the sort of the future agenda. I won't mention all of them because obviously some of them are uh, uh, self-evident. Uh, the policy and operations one really, really important. We still, we're still a bit divided, aren't we, John? You know, we're much better having the person who's going to actually have to implement it in the room when the decision is made, but it's still not perfect, and there is still a lot of... You still occasionally get this. It was a great policy. It just couldn't be implemented. It's an extraordinary definition of what a great policy is. You would have thought that being able to implement it might be some, in some way fundamental. But anyway, so we've got more to do on that. Um, again, a Cabinet Secretary uh, point. The UK's place in the world question, not particularly around Brexit that Mark asks it. He asks it about the rise of China and the Far East and you know, how's the UK going to respond to that in policy terms, you know, the big economic changes coming uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the world. And, uh, and I did have your digital data and technology uh, question up there, which will clearly be huge and not entirely positive. No, so just in my own area, um, at, uh, the Chief Medical Officer's favourite subject, antimicrobial resistance, we have a serious possibility of going technologically backwards, you know, getting to the point where things we previously could treat we can no longer. So taking um, uh, technological change, obviously some huge opportunities, but also some massive risks uh, for us. So where does that leave us? And as I say, I'll finish. We still want to be open, professional, consistent, but also going forward, we want to be three things. I do think we need to be tech-enabled much more than we are. 
I do think that digital policy making, not the tech bit of it, but the relationship and the how it changes, I think that is hugely important. We also need to be humble policy makers, actually confident and humble. I've said this before. Policy makers should not be in the position of thinking, I'm the person who knows the answer. They should be in the position of thinking, I am the person who can galvanise the answer to be created, which is an intrinsically humble activity. It's also, as I say, very self-confident to be in that point. But, um, so that hum humble self-confident uh, thing. And finally, and it also goes with the tech thing, I do think we just need to be much more iterative. Um, the traditional way of making policy, you know, we're going to publish a white paper, we're going to consult on it, and then we do the answer, implies the government always has the answer. Now, what those digital things open up is actually a much more iterative way of doing policy, where you try things out, you get responses, you amend 5% of it, etc., and it's never done. You, know, you don't say, that here's the finished policy. Um, for those issues where, you know, I don't know, future of social care is a great one, it's going to change as demographics and technology changes. There's never going to be an answer, and therefore what you want is a much more iterative type of policy making that is a conversation with the country as opposed to we the government announce the answer. Uh, well, so uh, that's my view of where we're going. I've spoken for far too long, uh, but hopefully some of that was uh, interesting and we will uh, pick up whatever you like in the conversation. Thank you, Chris. Uh, a lot to pick up, I think, from all of this. And we've got about half an hour for questions, but I'm going to come in with one myself. And I'm glad you brought up iterative there at the end, because uh, that's the one I want to talk about. You've talked about consistency a lot. Yep. You've talked about skills and techniques that policymakers need to have. But obviously, yes, most policy is iterative. It's yep. building on what's come before. And it also ought to be about learning the lessons from what comes before. Um, but do you think that actually there isn't enough evaluation built into policies? You mentioned turnover of staff. One of the big problems is that the people who perhaps initiate a new stage in a policy aren't there at the end. So the, whoever might be doing the evaluation, if indeed it is even there in the policy, isn't there to learn from it. But also institutional memory is crucial to this. Uh, to some extent, this speaks as if each new policymaker is coming to it afresh, but obviously they're not. They're building on what their predecessor did before. Are we doing enough to make sure that institutional memory, learning those lessons about what went before, as well as sort of systematic analysis of those policies, did they work? Is that built into this enough? Um, oh, that's a very good question. Um, I think actually we have over-relied on individuals being in a place for a long time. Um, i.e. we have underinvested in knowledge management and knowledge transfer and assumed that we'll be able to find whoever did it last time. Now, you do want people who stay in post for uh, a long time become actual experts in subjects, but that can't be, that shouldn't be a, um, um, a, uh, an excuse not to do the knowledge management bit. Probably, and again, of course, the technology opens up um, uh, much more sophisticated ways of doing knowledge management, but only if you use it mm. well. I mean, if I'm honest, and knowledge management for a long time um, when we uh, went digital was worse than when we had paper files, uh, because you really used to think about what you put on a file. Mm. Now, people now do again, but there's actually a period when the public record is much worse, mm. because what there is is a load of emails. Mm. As, it were, as opposed to someone whose job it was to create you know, the, the auditable record of what happened. I'll say it's not like that now, mm. um, but there was a period when actually the technology led us astray. So I think that's a very important thing. And then the evaluation thing. I think um, um, what, we, um, uh, what we don't do is hardwire evaluation into um, everything we do from the outset. Mm. Um, now, there is a place for the sort of, um, right, here's the evaluation contract. Um, but self-evaluating policies. Um, so um, I did a study of school bureaucracy uh, once. Everyone's done a study of school bureaucracy if you worked in education. Um, and um, and uh, 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 this isn't a suck up. We went to see Sainsbury's. Um, now, one of Sainsbury's rules was you're not allowed to introduce any system which doesn't create the data to evaluate how that system works as a mindset, mm. right? Where in government does that, mm. right? The operation of the system itself will create the data by which you evaluate. Now, obviously, we're very different from a supermarket and blah, blah, but that mindset of part of creating the policy in the first place is that it will create its own evaluation of itself. Mm. 
you know, it will generate the data that researchers can look at, that you can look at, and etc. That's not normally our mindset. Our mindset is normally, here's how to implement a policy. Right now, how are we going to evaluate it? And I do think that's, and I say there's a place for that, but it's the wrong way of thinking about it. So yeah. it comes into the technology bit, actually. Yeah. Um, that our ability, we need to be much more, we need to be much cleverer about creating the right data streams out of the operations of systems so that we can tell in real time whether those systems are working. Mm. Is it just it technology, though? Because no, we've mindset. been talking about that. It, yeah. And is it not also culture yes. that you're rewarding that yes. and you're not just rewarding getting the job done this Absolutely. time around? Yeah, and we have. We had, as um, um, you probably couldn't read it, but evaluation is yeah. one of the blocks of things we think any policymaker should be able to uh, understand. And as I say, um, you know, we are very different from a supermarket, but that mindset mm -hmm. um, is replicable and it's not really technology. Mm. related you know if you are going into your thinking about your policy generation mm -hmm. as if it doesn't self-evaluate itself then it is a bad policy that's a mindset change as opposed to I've yeah. got a clever box that does something yeah okay I'm going to open it up to the floor uh, I've already got some hands up I will ask you to say who you are and I'll take some batches of three so uh, start over there on the left with Tracy and wait Hi. for the microphone. Uh, Tracy Brown from Sense About Science. Uh, we worked with the Institute for Government on creating the evidence transparency framework. Yep. Uh, and we've had two spot checks uh, that we've, we've conducted since. Um, and there are lots of reasons why you would want to be transparent about the chain of reasoning, the, account, you know, the, the assessments that led up to a policy, uh, in terms of people being able to input, as your uh, chart showed, people being able to input into the policy, see what was missing, internal transmission, historical memory. But actually the reason why we did that was because we felt it was important that people could engage with the policy making process. And when I look at your, um, your circular chart there and you're talking about digital and sort of looking at user experiences um, of the system, I feel that, that government still looks at the public as, uh, as a service user, primarily and is perhaps missing something with looking yeah. at the possibility for engagement in the policy process. And that can be very, very important sometimes. You know, midwives need to see what the rationale is for, for a vaccine. Yeah. Farmers need not to have a conspiracy theory about DEFRA, etc. cetera. Um, but I do worry that, that that's missing. And it's also, it's also something very valuable for exactly what you're saying about evaluation and so on. Because we found that, say, DWP, uh, when explaining well the rationale, the chain of reasoning that led up to a policy, were far clearer about mm. what they were going to evaluate. Uh, and so in terms of the actual process of their own thinking, it seemed to improve the more they yeah. internalised the public uh, as an audience to the policy-making process, as, as the account accountability structure a little bit, uh, rather than just simply a service user. Right. Thank you. Uh, who is next? Over here on the right and then at the back. Thank you, Alan Bailey, formerly Treasury and Transport, but all a very long time ago. And um, I'm delighted <coughs> to hear this presentation. It makes me feel a bit like Monsieur Jourdain in, in Bourgeois Gentilhomme, you remember, who was very pleased to be told that all his life he'd been speaking in prose. There is that kind of continuity about what you're saying with the experience of all of us in, in civil service. And particularly, um, your remark that the um, policy-making profession is not actually a profession, that it, it, and one illustration of this, I mean, I always thought of it more as a management of policy advice, that as you go up through the grades, you're not actually forming policy better, you're getting better at running people, like, as you said about economists, knowing what questions to ask, and, and getting the policy uh, made in a properly high quality fashion. Um, and all that seems to me um, uh, familiar, um, uh, except that, um, as you say, there's a, there's a, it's got more complicated, it's got more articulated, but also technologically complex. And, um, uh, and we certainly didn't address these issues. And I think my question is, how on earth do you get uh, people who are b very busy managing policy advice in an environment where they're cutting back on numbers, confronting Brexit, to pay any attention to it at all. 
Okay, and then Dan uh, at the back there. Sorry, Dan, put your hand up and say who you are. Uh, Hello, thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, Dan Corey from New Philanthropy Capital, but um, former special advisor and uh, had the pleasure of working with Chris in different departments in the past. Um, I, I just wonder, in your Venn diagram to start with, you've got, you've got a kind of yeah. democracy politics yeah. one, and really whether, you know, you, you almost presented these, these three as though they're equally weighted. But in truth, the way policy often goes is there are policy hype cycles, and things come and go, yeah. and some of what policymakers do is, is, and politicians do too, is they leap on whatever's happening. I mean, as an example at the minute, everyone in government seemed, when they're not obsessed about Brexit, obsessed about place-based work. And for those of us who feel we spent 30 years working on it, it's kind of weird that this is the new thing. But, that, but it is the new thing, and if you're where I work in the charities, they all realise that's the buzz thing, so you push on that and you present everything like that. So there's a lot of that kind of stuff that happens as fashions, and what does that mean for the policy professional? Right. Those are three incredibly difficult questions. Yeah. Right, um, on your evidence and transparency one, I mean, I agree with basically everything you said. Um, at, um, and I certainly was not trying to give the impression that um, what I was talking about is just user engagement. I mean, for one thing, um, policy is, is there to serve the users of public services, but it's also there to serve the taxpayer, who is not necessarily a user of public services, and also the voter. Uh, who is also not necessarily a user of public services, who are undoubtedly looking at the, you know, the public in the widest sense. And I agree with everything you say about um, uh, the, the different type of conversation you can have, which I say in Policy Lab again does this you know, co-creation of policy with the people who are you know, quotes the service users is obviously a very big thing. Um, the transparency thing, I mean, uh, you, you, um, I mean, you take your choice. You can be much more transparent if you want to be. You know, New Zealand publishes um, a vast majority of its policy advice. That means its policy advice reads very differently. But they know that, you know, and you work with that. And, um, and um, you know, you can pick your point on the spectrum. Personally, I like um, there being a private bit to policy advice where you can be as frank as you want. But then you're completely right about you know, explaining the policy rationale. Now, I mean, the vast majority of policies are implemented by consent, both of the people doing them and, um, uh, the, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the people who are benefiting. Um, and, uh, yeah, we can forget that. You know, so in my world, um, it is simply impossible to implement a policy that uh, contravenes medical ethics, and no, so no one tries. Why would you? you know, it doesn't really matter uh, what circular the department puts out. If a doctor does not actually believe that this is in accordance with their professional standards, they're just not going to do it. And that's, of course, the right thing. Um, and uh, so that thing of, yes, policy by consent, in a sort of positive thing, I think, is uh, very, very important. Uh, the pay attention thing, um, I think you've... Um, um, well, we do actually have a lot of people doing these things, um, which is, of course, good. But um, what you say exemplifies where we are as to where we've got to be. So, to, again, take my medical examples. Um, no doctor says, I don't have time um, to be up to date with latest medical thinking. That is the same as saying, I am not a competent doctor, as it were. No one would say it. Um, at, um, and, um, and we want uh, the policy profession to have the same sort of thing. But, but yes, of course you have lots of pressures, but being at the, you know, at the cutting edge of your profession, that is your responsibility that comes with your paycheck in exactly the same way as an engineer would think that or an economist or whatever. But, so you're right, but that is the, uh, uh, that is the challenge. Um, uh, and Dan, your one. Um, yes. Um, I mean, clearly that does happen, and at one level it's of course right that it happens because the direction of policy ought to be directed by people who won elections and politicians and in line with public opinion, etc. Um, and of course, policymakers need to understand all that and also take the opportunities when they come. You know, that something or other, there's a chance to move something forward and you know, the stars are aligned and all that. Um, but also, in terms of the advice that we give, we also to, should to some extent ignore it. Um, now, whether politicians and others rightly decide that that is not the priority right now, um, fine. But our advice ought to be the honest, uh, fearless, 
um, this is what we think. Obviously, it's up to you whether now is the moment to progress it, um, or etc. And it can also be a, um, uh, a positive thing. So, um, uh, as I say, the one the Department of Health is doing today, this is the policy plug, we're doing, launching our campaign on changes to organ donation from an opt-out system to an opt-in uh, system. Uh, when we were developing the policy around that, there's obviously a technical bit of is it the right thing to do? Can we actually do it? But there's a huge public opinion piece in that. And of course, public opinion changes and the policy cannot work unless it is in line with pu public opinion. Um, so the, can it be delivered? And is the time right for where you know, society accepts that that approach to organ donation, and not everyone does, and we have safeguards, and et cetera, is right, is an intrinsic part of understanding whether your policy will work. Uh, well, so we, should, we, we shouldn't think, um, I mean, it's an it's extremely interesting uh, debate, this, you know, and it's, a, it's, it's not really party political, but it's d deeply moral and ethical. Um, there were very different opinions in public, uh, amongst the public, about um, you know, things that are you know, well ingrained, like kidney transplants, heart transplants. People f think very differently about hand transplants and face transplants, which are right at the cutting edge of technology, and we don't have the same policy um, for each of these things because you have to be where public opinion is, as it were, as a way of, and it comes to the point about you can only in, um, implement by consent, actually understanding the dynamics of the public debate is intrinsic to whether you can create a deliverable policy or not. So you, what you say definitely happens, but it's not always a bad thing. to uh, in the door if there's anyone else uh, in the other room who wants to come and ask a question as well please do pop your head around the door uh, and then another person I've worked with yeah. Yeah. Uh, just to say I'm not the door I am Julian McRae yeah. uh, from uh, King's College London but also an associate at the Institute for Government um, and I was here in 2013 Chris yeah. when you gave your original talk yeah. and I just want to say it's really really refreshing to have someone come back have the same list up there, be open about what's worked, but also be really open about the remaining challenges and how to take that forward, and seeing this as a really long-term project. Uh, I think that's an excellent open attitude for the civil service to take. Um, I wanted just to pick up on one of the things you talked about, engagement, and reaching out beyond experts. Uh, and I was just wondering how far you thought that could go, and how far it can help us navigate some really, really difficult policy issues that have been around for a long time. Um, and not just about government engaging with people, but supporting people to engage with each other, where they have different viewpoints, different backgrounds, uh, to navigate themselves through some of the tricky arguments. So I'm thinking in terms of what happened in Ireland around their slightly more successful referendum, maybe, at pulling people forward around abortion, where it was preceded by quite a long citizen assembly process which teased out a lot of the emotive arguments and how they could be translated into practical policy, which actually created a democratic moment where it was helpful, as you were saying, for a society to realize they actually could get through what it thought of as a stuck political issue for it. I just wonder, are there ways that the UK can move forward in that way? So taking engagement, not just we talk to them, but helping people to talk to each other and finding routes through. Okay, um, the gentleman here on the right, and then I'll come to another one here, and then I'll go to the back in a minute. Um, hi, my name's Matthew Trimming. I do a bit of advisory work to the Treasury and uh, the Cabinet Office on digital, um, and a few other things. But um, one thing that John Manzoni has spoken quite a lot about, which I suspect was behind your point about generalism at uh, the beginning, was a culture that he came into sort of five years ago that really had that sort of policy elite mentality um, that stretched across everything that government did. People always looking up to ministers, I mean, he's spoken about this far more eloquently than I am now in this room. And I just, I'll take the opportunity of having John Thompson in the room as well to ask from your perspective, Chris, what is the most important thing for the operational profession to hold in its head? about the policy profession, and to John, vice versa, really. Okay, and then the gentleman just in front there, sorry. 
Thank you. Hi, my name's Chris Carr. I'm the Director of Better Regulation at the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. I'm also the leader of the customer strand of policy profession 2025. This may not be the best way to introduce myself, but uh, here goes. Um, I wanted to pick up on the um, observation you made about consistency, how some policy yep. submissions are exactly what was ordered and others very, very significantly less so. Um, part of me wonders whether we're being given sufficient credit for our ability to produce mediocre work. But my, <laughs> my question is really whether you think that that is entirely about the skills and activities of the policy profession or whether there is anything that we need to do to improve the consistency of attitudes and behaviours of ministers as customers. That's no, a tricky one there. That's not it? a tricky one. Uh, it's, um, um, yeah, uh, Julian's one, the engagement, co-creation, people talking to each other. Um, I mean, clearly, everyone does want that to happen. Uh, the thing I was mulling was whether it's the government's job or whether the government is best placed um, to be sparking that. Because there are quite a lot of public policy issues where actually having a civil society debate is better than here's what the government thinks, what do you think, um, etc. And um, it happens much more in some areas than others. So, and again, I'll say I draw on help because I actually know something, like to think I know something about it. Um, because it's got this incredibly long history of sort of 2,000 years, um, you know, it actually predates most governments of debate, an awful lot of questions which in other sectors might well be government questions, are actually civil society debates. So if you take something you know, um, uh, pertinent to everyone, end of life care, for example, um, which is debated in the health service and by individuals and by the voluntary sector without government really participating. I think for issues like that, it may actually be better for it to be done in that way um, as opposed to it coming into the political world. So I agree with the sentiment of what you want. I think the, the government should not necessarily see itself as the answer to the correct question uh, that you pose. Um, the operations uh, one, oh, I won't make John answer as he's um, done one of these sessions uh, himself, uh, but my one is always the who is in the room when the decision is made um, and is one of the people who is in the room or preferably more than one. Um, uh, from those backgrounds. So um, uh, uh, my standing example is when I was at education, uh, we closed down an awful lot of the uh, uh, NDPBs and they became executive agencies. So suddenly, a lot of the people who were, quote, deliverers were part of the department and therefore in the room when decisions were made. And the things they would say is, yeah, you can do that, Minister. Uh, but if you want 100% of what you've just said, I need to build you an entirely new platform. It'll cost you 50 million quid. It'll take three years, and we all know what happens to <laughs> those sorts of programs. Whereas if you want 90% of your policy, I can do it off my existing platform, and I can do it two weeks on Tuesday for £10.50. Which would you like? Now, most ministers, uh, <laughs> when confronted with that choice, <laughs> um, take the very sensible choice. Now, and the difference was you know, that the person is in the room, as it were. So, I, personally, I think that thing of who is actually in the room when the decision is made, empowered to speak, um, able to contribute. I say, and this is the point someone else made about you know, not an elite policy profession, that person is making policy. No, their background may be commercial or it may be IT or whatever. No, in my case, we have the chief medical officer in the room who's not a policy professional, but she definitely makes policy. Um, you know, who is in the room when the decision is made? And is it a diverse set of people who think different things and bring different skills to the table? That would be my uh, one. Actually, I will ask John, what would yours? <laughs> you can think about it for a bit while I do the third one. Um, and uh, the consistency uh, one. Um, at, um, um, I, I don't answer the question about ministers. Obviously, IFG does a lot of things with ministers. Um, and, um, but uh, A, it's not their job. And B, I do think we can use it as an excuse. So as far as I am concerned, the job of the policymaker is to give brilliant policy advice and to focus on that. 
So if everyone is thinking, how do I make my policy advice as good as it and evidence-based as it conceivably can be, um, you know, and full and fair and giving options and et cetera, and we focus on that, uh, we will make the world better. And that's the bit that's in our control. Um, now, and as I say, um, there are clearly just like with any other walk of life, um, uh, ministerial decision making, and etc. Uh, there are ways of doing it well and badly, but there are other people in the world who worry about those things. I think the civil service should worry about what is the quality of what we do, as it were, as being the bit that uh, uh, we control. Have you thought of an answer now, John? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to go for the answer. Sorry, John Thompson, Chief Executive of HMRC. I, 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 first of all, I agree with Chris's three circles. I think it's a really excellent way of putting it, and from the delivery perspective, the more you can have the delivery professionals in the room when the minister's actually making a decision, the more likely it is it's actually going to get achieved within the timescale that the minister wants to actually uh, deliver against. And that is a significant challenge in that ministers generally want to go further and faster than we can actually really do it. We're constantly in a debate about how far and how fast can you go within the cost envelope. Uh, I thought your example brought it to life really brilliantly. And, and having a having somebody who's in operational delivery or commercial or digital or whatever saying, yes, but you've actually got these choices, these choices in these timescales to reach these sorts of targets, brings a much more realistic delivery schedule to all of us and therefore more successful public services, frankly. That's where I'm coming from. Yes, and, and helps everyone because, of course, the worst conversations you have ever uh, is when a minister turns around to you and says, why didn't you tell me a year ago that there was a much simpler way of doing this? Um, well, I didn't get everything I wanted, but I got most of it. Well, you know, why wasn't I told? You know, and uh, they would rightly um, you know, expect better than that. Mm. Okay, we're running out of time, so I'm going to take two quick ones. I said I'd go to the back, so yes, gentlemen there, and then I'll come to the lady. Yes, I'll, I'll try and get all three in. Sorry. Tim Gordon for Best Practice Artificial Intelligence. Uh, you mentioned Goldman's as you went through the, the, the very impressive presentation. If you think about a lot of the other sort of corporates out there who are in the same sort of advice business, if you like, so whether the big strategy firms or big banks, whatever it might be, they're all going through a massive shift in terms of their staffing where they're recruiting data scientists especially and people who could become data scientists at an incredible rate. There's a huge sucking sound as those salaries are shooting up and they're putting those people at the heart of the culture and the process they're using. Is that a recruitment process that government is going through? And if not, should it be? Okay, good question. And then, yes, lady at the front and then gentleman behind her. Sorry, Freddie. Hi, Penny Young, the House of Commons Librarian. Can I probe you a bit on testing the quality of policy advice? You sort of said, oh, it's all quite difficult, isn't it? Um, in terms of where you've got to, you've been quite candid, haven't standardised it, encouraged people to do it, some have including tests of, of ministerial sort of satisfaction, and obviously that will only do part of it. Um, given you've come up with a really big framework of what good policy making looks like, there's a lot of learning development underpinning all of that, I just wonder why you wouldn't go further and routinely um, evaluate the quality of each piece of policy advice really as a way of um, ensuring that it's as great as it possibly could be. Hi, Alison McClellan, editor of the Health Service Journal. Hello, Chris. Um, of course, the great majority of policy as regards the NHS is not made by civil servants. It's not even made by ministers. Yeah. It's made by public servants. Uh, I wonder if that's a, an approach you would recommend to other departments and also how you manage the tension to keep the standards. And um, to a related question, if the standards and the way of working uh, had, uh, that you're now trying to put into place, if they had been existing in 2012, would the land, <coughs> would the Lansley registration, <coughs> would the Lansley legislation not uh, have turned out to be the car crash that it turned out to be? You've only got four minutes. I've got four minutes. <laughs> I may not do the whole of your question, I say, yeah. Uh, data scientists, uh, yes, we are, but probably not fast enough. And, uh, and as you say, it's a very, very competitive market out there. Um, so uh, it's something certainly we have to go further on. And also the ability of people who are not data scientists to use the data scientists that we have really well. You know, so there's some brilliant data scientists in government. Do we all use data science as well as we could? Probably not. So I do think that's a... Uh, 
Here we are. Um, the testing of quality, I mean, we do do quite a lot on this. I mean, more by some, um, certainly what we do in health and what we used to do in education and in a lot of departments do is we do do sample surveys. You know, so where you take a sample, 10% you know, uh, of the submissions that have gone up and evaluate them, which is a really useful practice, but what it doesn't get you to is a number, as it were. So you can, you can evaluate individual pieces of work and say it's good and bad and this is the learning. It's very difficult to say, as I said, our policy making this year is better than our policy making was last year. Um, because it's very, it's quite, you know, it's very subjective. That. So what I really don't want to do, I don't want to oversell our ability to measure the quality, though you have to do lots of things whereby you measure the quality uh, of uh, uh, things. Uh, your public servant, civil servants uh, thing, actually um, uh, you were possibly one of the very few people who watch my public accounts committee uh, appearances. We were debating this with the PAC yesterday and what we're doing in health is actually a different way of making policy um, whereby the NHS itself um, uh, is uh, um, uh, proposing things and testing them and then coming to government um, and saying, if you want us to do X, this is the type of legislation we would need, or this is the kind of policy framework uh, uh, we would need. I think that's a really powerful way of making policy, actually. Um, now, I'm, uh, uh, you, uh, it won't surprise you that I'm not really going to answer your 2012 Act uh, question. Uh, I was uh, uh, Director General for the Deputy Prime Minister uh, at the time of the 2012 Act, so it was a participant um, at, uh, and therefore I don't comment but I, what I will say and I've said in public before of the model of making policy and it comes back to the iterative policy thing where you and this is no comment on that act specifically but where you you decide on a model legislate for it then deliver and discover that it doesn't quite work how you wanted it to but you now can't change because it's set in legislation is not a great way to make policy. So what I and Simon Stevens and others are doing at the moment, we say around the legislative process at the moment, no, the NHS is testing a whole range of things, see what works, and then legislate for that. No, legislate for a model that you've tested somewhere and now know works. Um, uh, to having learned some things along the way so that when you go to Parliament say I want powers and etc which is of course a vital bit of the process you're actually getting the model that you want as opposed to the one you've drawn up but haven't implemented because you haven't passed your legislation and I do think and well we will see if it works it's a different way of doing it I think it is a potentially very powerful way of making policy because we do have this there is a sort of dilemma here, and the NHS is, as you know, a perfect example of it, is it is right that government can only act in accordance with the legislation it passed and consent and that the public knows what it's getting and etc. all the things that go into making a law, but you also need to be flexible enough to allow yourself to try some things out so that you know that what you're doing is working. And squaring that circle in how you make policy um, is always a challenge. And what we are trying out, as we were discussing with the Public Accounts Committee yesterday, is, is an attempt at doing that. And I do think it's a really, really interesting uh, uh, model, particularly in a sector where, as you say, um, you know, if you've got a sector of 1.4 million people, um, of course a few civil servants and a few ministers are not taking every policy decision, and, and you wouldn't want them to. You want you know, the person who understands the local area to take the decision, the person who's the specialist in the area, the person who's got the medical expertise, you know, you, you want power at those sorts of levels. But then, of course, you do want overall ministerial responsibility and for the voter and the public to know what they're getting and be able to uh, 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 hold us to account, as you, of course, assist us with, which we can finish with. Right, and on that, thank you, Chris. Uh, it's been a, a great uh, opportunity to talk to you here today, and I'm sure you'll be pleased to know the Institute looks forward to continuing to watch what the policy profession do and offer its thoughts on how to improve further. Uh, and thank you all for coming today, and please join me in thanking Chris and thanking our sponsors, Oracle.